Personal story segment tonight, according to the Gallup and Rasmussen polls and a new CNN poll, Texas Governor Rick Perry now is a double-digit lead over Mitt Romney and everybody else in the Republican field. That means Mr. Perry is a big target for those who do not like the GOP. But the important question is, is the governor qualified to be president? Joining us now from Austin, Texas, Bob Mann, former press secretary for Ted Kennedy, and our pal Kinky Friedman, who himself ran for governor against Rick Perry. So do you like the guy, uh, Mr. Friedman? Uh, I do, Bill. Uh, I think, uh, you know, he's a fellow Texan and so forth, but I'm kind of in a Lincoln and uh, Churchill uh, spirit. Uh, I'm finding good in, uh, in a former uh, foe, you know, and, and there's a lot of good in Rick Perry. Tell me why. Tell me what's one, good about him. Well, 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 there's one thing. He's, he's a nuts and bolts guy with the economy. If you're going to give Obama credit for killing bin Laden, you got to give Rick Perry credit for doing pretty well with the Texas economy. And Obama has done for the economy what uh, pantyhose did for foreplay. So you believe that Perry's main, um, main campaign theme, that he's a good economic guy, is true, but Texas does have a budget gap of between 15 and 27 billion dollars. I mean, you know, they owe a lot of money. There's a lot of shortfall in Texas. Well, uh, you know, part of it is that I would uh, support Charlie Sheen over Obama, but uh, but but <laughs> I, right. I, I I think there there's a dignity in Rick Perry and there's a I, I really think that his best days are ahead of him. And you know, it's hard to distinguish yourself. You think he's an honest guy, governor. Kinky? You think he's an honest guy? Oh, yeah. All right, if he now, follows the cowboy way, which he does, ride, shoot straight, and tell the truth. He does now, that. Now, Mr. Yeah. Mann, you don't really have much regard for the governor, but is, is that an ideological thing? Because he is a conservative, uh, religious kind of guy. No, on a personal level, I, I do not know Rick Perry. I only met him one time, and that was a very gracious meeting. I was at a funeral. I was standing by myself. He was then Secretary of Agriculture. He spotted me, came over, shook my hand, and introduced himself, and together we grieved over the uh, death of Carol Nealon, who was a television news reporter. So my impression personally was a, a very positive one. And uh, you find people in Texas who are extremely uh, fond of him and close to him, and you have others who are not so fond of him. And you come down in the political arena where? <laughs> well, I, I think it's hard to tell what Rick Perry really is. Is he a conservative or not? As you mentioned, the $27 billion budget deficit, something Texas had never had before. It was accumulated on his watch. He was out of the state during much of that time, denied that it would be that much. He said at one point it might be 10 or $15 billion. And then when he finally came back and faced it, he uh, blamed in large part the comptroller, Susan Combs, for the deficit. Uh, our unemployment uh, under Rick Perry, when Rick Perry became governor, Texas unemployment was at 4%. It has doubled on, on his watch. Yeah, but it still is Texas 8, 8. has... 8.2%. But under, the, under Perry, Texas has one of the best job creation, if not the best, in the country during the recession. And that's right. And much of that is, I think, just due to the tremendous growth of Texas, which I don't think Governor Perry or any governor has a lot to do with. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, if the, if the guy's been in charge for more than eight years and the tax rate is low and people want to live there, I don't think you can not give him credit. All right. One quick question for you, and then I'll come back to you, Mr. Matt. Um, you're going you're gonna to vote for Perry? I mean, right now, the way it stands, you got Romney, you got Bachman, a number of others. Perry's your guy, Kinky? Yeah, yeah, Bill, it comes down to this. Do you prefer a president uh, that doesn't believe in evolution or do you prefer a president that doesn't believe in Israel? Okay, so that it's counts pretty me. clear cut for you. Now, are you, yeah. do you favor any of the Republican candidates, Mr. Mann, any of the others over Governor Perry? I have been very impressed in recent days with uh, Governor Huntsman, who understands the world of internationalism who seems to be an extremely intellectual type person, a man with seven children. And I think he's sort of a sleeping giant. And, and, and frankly, when they had the debate about uh, 10 days ago, I thought Newt Gingrich was the winner. If Newt uh, was as likable in the past as he was that night, Newt's star would still be on, on the rise. All the right. other candidates, I think, are marginal. Okay, gentlemen, we appreciate it. Thanks very much. Plenty more ahead. It's a fact.
today, the nation remembers and pays tribute to Senator Ted Kennedy. His final resting place just a few hours away now at Arlington National Cemetery. Meantime, our next guest once worked for Senator Kennedy as his press secretary. Bob Mann joins me now. You were working as the press secretary between 84 and 87, but today and over the last three days, taking in so much that's been said of Senator Kennedy, how are you feeling today? Well, once you work for Ted Kennedy, you always work for Ted Kennedy. It's a big family. It's, it's a big family, and, and I've uh, been, it's been nice to do things with Patrick and Joe and other members of the family over the years. About uh, 15 months ago, my phone rang at 7 a.m. And a voice said, uh, Bob, uh, Ted Kennedy, to which I said, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> he said, don't you teach down at that college down in, uh, down in San Marcos uh, where LBJ went to school? <laughs> I said, yes, I'm going to be down there, going to do Obama, going to need some remarks, and uh, uh, have Ben Bonds uh, show up at the airport and pick me up. And somebody called you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. So his voice so, sounding strong, not sounding anything. Seven a.m. Worry of the brain tumor that he was no. diagnosed with around well, that same time. Well, that was time. three months later. That came ah. three months later. So I was lucky to be able to be around him there toward the end, and he came down. And I would, did not know if the young college people of today in that part of Texas would really know who Ted Kennedy was. I thought maybe 40, 50 students, but we, we reserved a big auditorium. 4,000 kids. Wow. And after he spoke, they rushed the stage like he were a rock star. He said, I've got to touch them, Bob. Grab my, the back of my belt. <laughs> he leaned over. I grabbed his belt and he said, don't drop me. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that I, I just sort of like to touch on, even during this, this very serious time, and I think he would want that, is the humor of Ted Kennedy. Because he often, I would say, him use humor to, uh, to, to neutralize anger and differences. Uh, the most dramatic example, we were, had a, a stalker, and we had many stalkers, and most of them were harmless people who would come to the Kennedy office because they knew the Kennedys would help them and with emotional just problems. But we had a fellow who, who showed up several days in a row, not a big guy, very clean cut, sports jacket, maybe 35, and he would stand and lean against the wall across the, the hall. Well, one day I came in at about nine and he was sitting in the office carving an apple with a knife, a okay. large pocket knife. And you should have been worried, and, I and guess, should right? should have been worried. I don't know how he got it through security. I called security, they came for him, cuffed him, arrested him, and took him away. The next morning, there he was again, not across the hall from the receptionist, but from Senator Kennedy's office door, which only opens from the inside. Uh -huh. I went and I said, Senator, he's back. Let's get security. Don't go out the door. And what was and the senator's he, reaction? Well, Senator winked at me and said, watch this. He walked out the door, took three long strides, and Ted was about 6'3 and broad shoulders. This guy was maybe 5'8". He got right in his face. He said, hey, how are you? How are you? <laughs> and then he left. The fellow never came oh, back. Interesting. So he turned what could have been, uh, you know, a, a frightening, a moment, frightening moment. Somebody one. just hurt. He turned, and he had the courage to do that. And there would have been no way, no way to stop well, it. Well, I love the way you also have described that working for him really meant it was a contact sport. It was a that contact. he put 150 percent into it, and the expectation was everyone who worked with him and alongside him would have to do the he, same thing. He would make great demands. He would shout and scream during the day. He would praise you, but he would also very candidly let you know what, what he wanted. He was accustomed to the best work. But at six or seven or eight, he'd buzz me or other staff members and said, hey, let's come in, come on in. Let's have a drink, let's talk about the day. What are we gonna do tomorrow? And he'd be chewing on potato chips or, or something else. So he- his, uh, his humor was very disarming. Was very disarming. Senator Orrin Hatch talked about that last night, how he went into it thinking, you know what, I'm gonna go after that guy, Senator Ted Kennedy. But in the he end, it turns out, yeah, they were just best of I, friends. I, 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 when I left him and went to work for a large business association, they said, how can you work for that damn liberal Ted Kennedy? And then I brought him to a, a fundraiser that, that they put on, and I forced them to put on it for him. By the time it was over, they said, Bob, how, how do I write a check to Senator Kennedy? And he had worked them over one at a time, made them laugh, and he was just a uh, marvelous in that respect. There's another aspect here, too, as we talk about his passing. And we saw it with the uh, remarks today by Ted Kennedy Jr. and by Patrick Kennedy. Um, I had not seen Ted Kennedy Jr. in a few years, and he's of course mature. Uh, looks a lot like a young Ted Kennedy. And he sounds, so, and he sounds a lot like him. Patrick comes to Texas often. He, he has many friends in Texas, and he usually comes to Austin. I'm going to get him at Texas State. I hope next time. <laughs> and Patrick, Patrick's a little, a little quieter. Uh, he was the invisible kid uh, when he was young. He couldn't. Go to some Did you see something different in them today? 
they, the, the torch is passing. The torch is passing. And Joe Kennedy Jr. is a marvelous person with leadership capability. Uh, the Kennedy women are stout as they have always been. Uh, so so this third generation, they, they are all quite accomplished in their own right. It may not necessarily be a huge political stage like what we saw in Senator, Senator Ted Kennedy or even in Bobby Kennedy or even in Jack Kennedy. However, they're all making a mark in different ways and, and public service is still at the forefront being a humanitarian, philanthropic, etc. But do you see this third well, generation here's, making yeah, here's, a here's what in a else different you, way? Here's what else you see. Even when you're talking to them about a football game or some other issues, almost always in the conversation will come, what is the right thing to do? What, what should we do? What should I do down here in Texas? There's, there's a core that never really leaves their aura of conversation. And, if, and I look for it now when I talk to them because we can tell stories, we can hood it up, we can be very serious. But, but with Patrick uh, Kennedy in particular, and when I've been with him, and with Joe, the, the, the core, I haven't been around. How do you see them effectively passing on that lesson to their kids as you saw Rose and Joe Kennedy pass on to you know Jack, Bobby, uh, Joe and Edward Kennedy they do, and they've done it to their kids. They do everything as a family. I was surprised when I first went to work for Senator Kennedy and we do the scheduled meetings before we do anything, before we do foreign affairs, military affairs. Okay, do I need to have a long, how long has it been since I've had, had lunch with John Jr.? I'll get Patrick in here, get uh, uh, get get Teddy Jr. in here. I need to take them to the Cape this weekend. So pretty we, like we this do all the, the time. Do the family scheduling first. Most of us, when we get busy and think we're important, the family suffers. That yeah. he they always came first, and I think from that he grew uh, he grew enormous strengths. Well, those were immediate family members. Before I let you go, I'm wondering. It seems as though he kind of he took in President Obama as yet you know as another family member, almost like a brother. The way in which he helped campaign, perhaps even help put President Obama over the top. What would be your view, based on your exposure to him as a former press secretary, how often, or do you even suppose Senator Kennedy picked up the phone and called President Obama while in office saying, you know what, here's my advice, or this is what I think you'd oh, do this time. I suspect it Jim. was a daily occurrence. You do think. Yeah. Senator Kennedy loves to be a mentor. He would have been a wonderful professor. He was my mentor. I think anyone who worked with him learned from them and he would go out of his way at the end of the day to, to touch bases and, and to provide counseling services and personal things, professional things. He was very much aware of your level of political sophistication, and then he would he would demand more. Oh, man. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Okay. And thanks for helping us to see another side of Senator Kennedy. Joining us now are two friends of Senator Kennedy in Newton, Massachusetts, Dick Clasby. And in Austin, Texas, is former press secretary Bob Mann. Good morning to you both. Our condolences. Good, good morning. Uh, good morning. Bob Mann, uh, to work shoulder to shoulder, elbow and by elbow with someone who uh, is dedicated to so many different causes. What was that work like in his office? Well, I never played football with Senator Kennedy. He was sort of beyond that when I worked for him. He was in his early 50s. But working for him was indeed a contact sport. He would, uh, it was very demanding, and he was a perfectionist. He read everything that crossed his desk. The staff kept an old briefcase, and if you wanted him to, to see something himself, you put that in what they called the bag. And he would take that home with maybe 10, 20, 30 items in it, and the next day you'd get back in his scribbled handwriting, ugh, or go for it, or come see me. The story that struck me early on in working for him was as he was getting ready to go to South Africa to confront the leaders of South Africa to do what he could to bring an end to apartheid. And some of the staff were concerned that there might well be an assassination attempt in that country. And I raised that question with Senator Kennedy one night. And he said to me, he said, Bob, I have to go. I'm the only man in the world who can call the type of attention that must be called for the leaders of South Africa to put it into apartheid. Uh, and my, Bob, my brother Bobby went, and if I'm to die, uh, following my brother's footsteps, trying to bring an end to the evils of apartheid, then I shall just die. <sighs> Courage was the one word that I saw time after time after time, physically, intellectually, politically, legislatively. Uh, yeah, Ted Kennedy uh, had a passion for life but also a passion to
to be, he was endeared, I think, he was fear, a fearless man in, in all respects. Bob, thank you so much, Dick. Thank you both very much for taking the time to speak with us today, and uh, please accept our condolences.